So, so, so going back to Genesis chapter 3, very small, insignificant word in Hebrew, ima, with her. And uh, she takes the fruit and gives it to him and he eats also and, and with her. In other words, the whole point in Genesis chapter 3 is that man and woman ate the fruit together at the same time. So in terms of who to blame, it's both of them equally. The Bible is very careful to say they did this together. Now, if you get all the English translations of that, you'll find a lot of English translations refuse to translate the Hebrew words with her. They just vanish, like it's not even in the Hebrew text. And the reason they've done this is because these Christian translations of the Bible are made by people who have a lot of baggage. The best part of 20 centuries of misogynistic attitudes and interpretations, which they dumped on top of the Bible and which have shaped how they interpret the Bible. So one responsibility we have Yes, we've received this wonderful history of reception, these 2,000 years of, of quite amazing traditions that we can access and, and, and learn from. But at the same time, it's our responsibility to get back to the original text, see what it really says, and get rid of the baggage of those 2,000 years uh, in, in all the problems that it brings, especially when it comes to misogyny. So, so Paul clearly receives... Um, the, the most ancient, the most authentic, therefore, uh, traditions of interpretation of what happened in Genesis chapter 3. Now, when Paul writes about gender, he's writing about gender in the context of family. Now, the problem in Greek is that the word for man and the word for husband are identical. And the next problem in Greek is that the word for woman and the word for wife are, are identical. So when Paul writes, I do not permit a wife to teach or have and have authority over a husband. You have a choice. You can either translate it like that or you can translate it and say, I do not permit a woman to teach and have authority over a man. You can choose to remove the text from its family context and place it in a general church context and therefore subjugate every woman to every man in a church. Now, of course, the problems with this, if you think about it, it turns into a folly. For example, if there's 10 men in a room and my wife walks in and the 10 men are having an argument, who's she meant to submit to? It doesn't make sense. In practice, it's impossible. But also, if you look at the Pauline passaging carefully, He's clearly talking about marriage and the family unit and maintaining order in the home. He's not talking about the church in general. The confusion comes, of course, is in, in, in that in, in the early church, they met in houses. And that's why Paul's really careful about this. Because when you meet in houses, if you're the householder and the preacher comes in and preaches and, and starts to sow discord between a married couple or a married couple come into somebody else's house and hear some teaching that sows discord in between them. Paul wants the married couple to sort it out between them privately. Wait till you get home, talk to your husband privately, sort it out. Don't allow the bond between man and wife to be disturbed by external forces. When's the first time we see the bond between man and wife ex uh, uh, exposed by an external force? Genesis chapter 3, when in comes the serpent between Adam and Eve. And that's why Paul uses that example. The problem is, is that now the church has become formalized and has buildings and has come, become removed from the household. When you come to interpret household passages in a non-household context, that's when these errors of interpretation come in because you're interpreting an entirely different context from, from the original point of the passage.